All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our weekly webinar here at UCI Beal Applied Innovation. Um, this week, we're going to be speaking with Alex Andrianopoulos on the subject of university technology investment in the COVID-19 pandemic from a life science perspective. So, um, and uh, as, as we get started here, I'll remind everyone that our goal for this uh, event is to continue to connect the Southern California ecosystem with experts and resources that will help the entrepreneurs and the founders navigate the current crisis and actually, more importantly, thrive in, in the recovery. So uh, for today's seminar or webinar with Alex Andrianopoulos, he's the chief R&D officer at Kairos Ventures. Alex leads the team of investment analysts at Kairos that conducts research and due diligence on all the companies that they consider for investment, either through incubation or Series A funds. Alex joined Kairos with 20 years of experience at high-tech companies specializing in enterprise software, ranging in size from startups with a handful of employees to behemoths with 10,000s of employees. At these companies, Alex led global teams responsible for product strategy, intellectual property protection, engineering, professional services, sales marketing, and business development. And he successfully closed multiple rounds of financing by venture capital firms, as well as from the public markets. While he was at Oracle, Alex led the research and strategic alignment efforts for numerous acquisitions up to billion dollar size deals. He's an electrical engineer by training, but has extensive life science experience as well. So before we get started, a few logistical details. Um, in order to make this virtual event efficient for everyone, uh, all the attendees will be on mute. But if you do have a question, uh, on the bottom of your box, or on the bottom of your control panel, there's a Q&A box. So if you want to enter your questions there, we'll see those. And as appropriate, we'll ask those either during uh, the chat with Alex, or we'll uh, ask them there at the very end. And a quick reminder that this presentation is being recorded. And that recording will be available later on the innovation.uci.edu website, which is uh, Applied Innovations website online. So, um, and uh, let's see, next week we'll be having Carrie Ransom from OC4. So keep an eye on your emails for uh, the announcement on that and the way to register for that event. So I think we've got all those uh, details uh, taken care of. So with that, uh, why don't we kick it off? And uh, Alex, I, I'm assuming you could hear me okay. I so, can uh, Alex, oh, terrific. So why don't we start off by uh, you filling, uh, filling us in a little bit more on your background, particularly you've had experience on both sides of the table. So tell us, tell us about uh, your experience there as both a strategic investor in startup companies and a startup guy yourself. Yes, uh, thank you, Luis. Good morning to start with, and thank you for uh, having me as part of this series of webinars. Very happy to be here and to partner with UCI and Applied Innovation. Um, about my background, as you, as you said, uh, my education has been in electrical engineering. I focused on software engineering the majority of my professional life. And I joined as part of that focus. I joined uh, a number of startups, I would say probably uh, a good dozen of startups so over the years, as well as mid-sized to large-sized companies, as you mentioned, like Oracle. And, uh, you know, when you are a, a part of a startup, let's say I, I joined a few companies where we were less than 10 people in each one of those. And when you're part of the startup, you, you're doing a number of things, but you do certainly one thing on a constant basis, and that is raise money. When you are small, um, what is lacking is typically speaking money. So in all the startups that I have uh, joined, I participated actively in the fundraising part by mm -hmm. pitching to VCs, uh, being literally on the other side of the table than where I sit now as a VC. And uh, I have to tell you that I definitely empathize with all the founders. In, uh, in, it is one of the hardest things to do, to, to raise money. Mm -hmm even if you have a fantastic product. And, and believe me, we worked on a number of great products. Now, I also had the fortune in my experience to work for larger companies. And when I worked as an example at Oracle, a very large public software company, we were growing at the period I, I was with them through uh, rapid acquisitions. We were making one acquisition on average every three weeks. And I was involved probably in one out of three of those acquisitions as part of uh, 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 identifying the strategy that we would follow, how we would merge the teams, and how we would basically integrate the offerings into the overall strategy of the company. So I also understood what 
a strategic investor, a corporate investor is looking for in a startup. And I think that that um, has educated me enough. I've been in this fortunate uh, position to both understand the needs of, the, of a startup as well as the needs of an acquirer, if you will, and try to bridge that divide in uh, my position now as a chief R&D officer here at Kairos. Okay, so, um, and, and from that, uh, when did you actually join Kairos? Yeah, actually, I, uh, I joined Kairos in 2015 when we, when we founded the, the, the company, the, the VC firm, back in 2015. Maybe I'll give you a little bit of a summary of how we came together, because we are okay. a little bit of a, of a different VC, if you will. Mm-hmm. To start with, uh, none of us here at Kairos have a, a long tradition of being VCs. Instead, all of us here at Kairos are either folks who uh, are entrepreneurs that started companies uh, and funded companies and, and grew them to, to, to large enough sizes and sold those companies, or we are scientists, scientists uh, that um, understand deep science, hard science, as we like to call it, uh, at our core. So that that is quote unquote one of the differences. But more importantly, uh, the difference is, um, we believe, is in that we, as a VC, we were founded with one goal: to identify great opportunities emanating out of university labs, research labs across the nation, and fund them. And why we have this goal? Because we realized Jim Dimitriadis, our our managing partner and founder and CEO. Um, uh, back in 2015, realized that there is a huge gap um, in terms of supply of funding and demand of funding in the hard science research-based space. And um, while there were, there is tremendous amounts of monies flowing into quote-unquote tech startups, you know, the, your your burrito delivery and your dog walking apps. There isn't as much money, as a matter of fact, in some cases, there is a dearth of, uh, of money in um, the hard science startups, the startups that are based not just in, on an idea, but on a true scientific invention, a true scientific invention that typically speaking takes place over years, if not decades of research at a university lab somewhere. So, so Jim identified that gap and he said uh, he, he was trying to help institutions that uh, had uh, uh, contributed to his success. And, um, and um, one of those institutions was Caltech, and he had realized that Caltech lacked uh, a, a dedicated VC fund uh, supporting the tremendous innovation emanating from that institution. And as a result, uh, in 2015, he decided to uh, found uh, uh, Kairos Ventures. And, uh, and to raise money to support those uh, scientific inventions um, emanating out of uh, Caltech as well as other universities. So it was during 2015 that Jim sold me, I was part of a public company back then as the global CMO. Um, he sold me in, in late 2014, early 2015 on the idea of creating Kairos. And, uh, and uh, uh, he sold me with one thing actually in reality is with him introducing me to some ridiculously tremendous opportunities where you actually see the invention coming from the university lab and you say this is a mind-boggling and b a no-brainer in terms of um, how intuitive it is that it, they, it makes sense to fund it to see it grow and become a huge success not only a huge success financially uh, we expect uh, that each one of our investments uh, I'm obviously the optimist here that each one of our investments will produce tremendous returns to our LPs. But also, we expect that uh, they're going to make a big difference uh, in, on humanity at large uh, and, and uh, a huge beneficial impact. We are both a life sciences and a physical sciences uh, VC, so we would invest in both life sciences and physical sciences opportunities. I understand we are talking about life sciences predominantly today, but uh, we recognize that that gap that I mentioned earlier, the gap that Jim identified and said that we need to do something about this exists across the board in terms of scientific innovation. It is very acute in the life sciences domain, but it's very, very similarly acute in the physical sciences domain. 
And since our, find, our founding back in 2015, we have invested in more than 50 companies. And also we have supported more than 100 uh, PIs in their research efforts uh, through separate uh, um, investment mechanisms, not just your traditional Series A investment or Series C investment. Right, and I, I wanted to roll into that because to do what you do and to achieve those goals, you need a slightly, you need a different model. You, you can't use the classic model and your firm has thought a lot about that. And so you've, you've changed the, the model or you, I'd say, added some components to it. So could you describe that, how in, in that sense, your, your entire approach is uh, somewhat different than what people might expect? Yeah, it's a good question that you're asking, Luis. The, the, typically speaking, VCs rely um, on uh, partners to drive the whole operation of their business, all the way from deal sourcing to diligence to deal management, closing, as well as ongoing monitoring, where basically a partner in a VC firm uh, leverages their network and their connections. And uh, uh, through that network and connections, they identify opportunities that they believe are good opportunities to, uh, to invest in. And then they, uh, um, they basically uh, champion the idea within the, the VC firm to, the, to, to their other partners. And assuming that uh, all partners or most partners agree, they invest. And then f subsequently that uh, champion partner, as I call them, would uh, subsequently take a board seat in the, in, the, in the startup and try to support them on an mm -hmm. ongoing basis. In our case, what we have recognized is that no individual Rolodex, no individual's Rolodex will have the necessarily connections to all the top tier research institutions like UCI's research institutions across the nation to be able to create that deal flow and moreover, to be able to diligence those very, very hard, that's the reason we call them hard science opportunities, those very hard to understand and appreciate opportunities. Because we are talking about here about the forefront of scientific research. What your PIs do and what our, the PIs from all our partners do is very, very hard. It's very, very difficult. As I said, it, it happens over years, if not decades of research. And it is also difficult to appreciate and, and understand. Obviously, we all understand the value of a, of a cancer therapeutic. If it is truly a therapeutic and it proves out in clinical trials, the value is obvious. But before that, to be able to identify early enough, and we are early investors, we, we like to invest as early as possible in a, research in, a, in a research invention that we believe has legs, so to speak. But it's very difficult to identify early enough the opportunity that uh, will truly become that uh, uh, miraculous drug in cancer or any other indication you are talking about. So, so what have we done? And how do we do this, right? We, we do this by partnering deeply with uh, the nexus of innovation in every one of our partner universities. We created partnerships with um, more than a dozen universities across the nation. And in each one of those universities, in turn, we created partnerships with their respective offices of technology transfer. There are many names that uh, uh, reflect that function, like, for example, at UCI, Applied Innovation. So we partnered with you folks deeply because you've, you, by being the folks who are asked to um, uh, support both financially and intellectually the, the, the patent prosecution, you actually see all the innovation that's uh, happening at the university. And thus you are the best folks to, to produce a, a deal flow, deal flow for folks like ourselves. So on a regular basis, as you know, Luis, we interact with the respective offices of technology transfer. Will you present to us a tremendous number of opportunities? I've got a team of scientists, as I mentioned earlier, our diligence team that uh, uh, dives deeply uh, into each one of those opportunities because we do care predominantly about the scientific innovation itself. As I said, we all know that it's going to be huge if we produce a cancer therapeutic, especially a cancer therapeutic for an unmet need, an indication in cancer that uh, we do not have a good therapeutic today. But 
How do we identify that? That is through deep scientific diligence by partnering with the PIs and the research teams, appreciating the science, and hopefully eventually funding the opportunity. Right, right. Um, thank you uh, for, for describing that. Someone just popped in, and I, I believe I know the answer, but I'll let you answer it uh, quickly. So you only invest in university innovation with your partner institutions. You don't go outside universities. Is that correct? Well, um, we actually source our deals through our partner universities and our partner research institutions. So, for example, we partner with national labs across the nation as okay. well, where deep science takes place. And we systematically um, connect with uh, those institutions to identify opportunities. Having said that, though, if there is this tremendous research opportunity happening outside, somehow this network of research labs that we have partnerships with, it's not that we're going to ignore it. We, we, we will take a look at it. But it still needs to be this clear scientific in innovation before we truly spend time on it. Because it's hard and it's expensive to do diligence at a very deep scientific diligence uh, uh, level. Our diligence team, a large team of uh, PhD scientists, it, uh, um, you know, they spend hours and hours, weeks and weeks, researching individual opportunities and that's as a result as you know time is money and and that is an expensive exercise those thus while we are not going to say no to outside opportunities we will take them with a little bit more of a grain of salt if you will uh, than mm -hmm. uh, than the ones uh, sourced by you our partners right okay um let's go ahead and, and start rolling into uh just what's going on kind of now in the world so um I'm curious, and, and do you recall when your team actually began discussing uh, this novel coronavirus and the implications it would have? Do you remember, was that in, uh, was that in January? Was that in February? Do you, do you recall one time when, when you and Jim or some of your scientists sat down and said, what's going on? Yeah, um, we definitely started talking about this at the executive level in February. Um, okay. Uh, we, we, my, on my research team, obviously, we were trying to keep tabs on what was going on in China during January, but the, the, the data points were scarce, typically speaking, and there were a lot of conflicting uh, pieces of information. In February, we started looking at it closely, and, uh, and towards the end of February is when we decided uh, to take action. Um, and like most VCs, as you can imagine, that action is... Uh, making sure that uh, we communicate a the our belief of um, of the seriousness of uh, the uh, epidemic the pandemic that it mm -hmm. became pandemic eventually the seriousness of the pandemic not only to uh, the health of, of of human beings but also to their financial wherewithal to their financial uh, well-being so uh, um, as a as a result we worked obviously as you can imagine with our portfolio companies warning them about uh, the, uh, the challenges coming in the future and asking them, if you will, to rethink their plans in a more conservative fashion. Right. Potentially, if you will, slow down hiring or, or stop hiring. Uh, and, uh, and especially the ones that were uh, considering raising funds, again, new, re new rounds of funding in the coming months, we told them it's probably that they should anticipate that they won't be able to raise successfully those funds at the worst case scenario, probably not before the end of the year. Hopefully, that is a pessimistic view of the world, uh, that things are going to turn out to be better. But uh, rather than just hoping, in addition to warning our portfolio companies, we decided, since we are a science VC, we decided that uh, we need to put our resources, the, the, the brains, if you will, of our scientists, as well as our partner scientists at institutions like UCI's, at work on this specific task, on yeah. the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this uh, is important. This is important. This is different. And I want to make sure people realize that, that this is different from then a lot of the approaches. So rather than, certainly they did go out and triage their portfolio companies, make sure they're okay, adjust their plans, et cetera. I, I think what's, what's fascinating about uh, Alex here is he's gonna get into is some specific things that you guys did for, uh, to come up with, um, to, to work on solutions for this crisis. So why don't you tell us about those? 
Yeah, and to be clear, I, we don't here at Kairos want to take credit ourselves just alone. It is the network of sci scientists that we have been funding um, and obviously our internal scientists that came together to, uh, uh, to meet and uh, step up to this challenge. And what happened was, uh, in some cases, we put a call out to our um, scientific partners, our PIs. In some cases themselves, they came to us and they said, hey, look guys, um, we have what we believe may be a good solution to some of the challenges that the pandemic is introducing. And as a result, um, uh, we need your help. And typically speaking, that means we need funding and coordination help and program management help. So out of this effort, what uh, has come out, Luis, is we here at Kairos, uh, we are funding three separate efforts, brand new um, funding arrangements since the pandemic uh, became a national emergency. Uh, three uh, uh, brand new opportunities, and we are looking at uh, dozens of others that are focused on solving parts, at least, of the, of the challenge around uh, COVID-19. As an example, we have uh, funded an effort and we are working on a daily basis with the team uh, to create a, a very rapid, we are talking about uh, five to 10 minute diagnostic, super accurate, very, very low rate of uh, false uh, negatives, which is very, very important uh, in, in, uh, in our case here with this pandemic, um, and also low cost. Um, and also, by the way, more importantly, I would say something that you can run um, uh, in the field, something that the use of the device can take place in the field, not just at the hospitals, but also in pharmacies, in physicians' offices, in de dentist offices. But beyond that, we are envisioning that we will be able to use this diagnostic device that we are funding um, in places like, um, you know, movie theaters potentially, in places like airports, in places like train stations, even at restaurants to enable that real-time determination if somebody, if you will, is infected by the virus or if they are not, and thus they can board the plane, they can board the train, they can go to a restaurant. Right, and in addition, more accurate than pointing at the thermometer at the forehead, obviously. Yeah, look, um, as, uh, as humans, again, we are trying to find solutions to this pandemic, this tsunami of bad news, right? And, and we are finding shortcuts. The, the thermometer is the... the the easiest and the, uh, the cheapest shortcut that we have found thus far. But we need to do better, right? If we were to reopen our economy, we need to have a crystal clear answer. Yes, you are infected. No, you're not infected. Without any ambiguity, maybe you're infected, maybe you're not. Because the maybe doesn't really help. We want to be able to go back to our offices. We want to be able to go back to our factories we want to be able to travel again. And the only way you can do that is with high accuracy, um, uh, point of care in quotes, but it's beyond point of care. It's a high accuracy field use diagnostic. And this is what one of our scientists that we have been supporting for years now has come up with and we are funding and we are expecting very soon to have this product in the hands of the FDA for emergency use approval. Oh. Interesting. Okay, it's it's that close. That's terrific. Um, you mentioned that one. Uh, either in as much detail as you can. What what about the other two? Yes, excellent answer. The, the, the diagnostics and testing is only one uh, question. I'm going to say excellent question. Well, only one of three. Excellent answer too. Yes, <laughs> thank you in advance. I guess uh, uh, one of three um, legs of the stool. The stool to the solution of opening the economy. So what I'm referring to here. So clearly we need testing. There's no doubt about this. And we can be doing better with testing. And that's the reason we here at Kairos, we are pouring a significant amount of our human capital and financial capital on that diagnostic that we mentioned. But there are two other uh, stu uh, legs to that stool, the proverbial stool. When, when number one, uh, I should say number two, is a therapeutic. Look, if someone is infected, it doesn't mean that we throw them away, right? We put them somewhere in quarantine and we hope for the best. We need to have a good therapeutic and we need to have it soon and we need to have it available uh, to uh, hospitals at, at great, great numbers. There, are, there is a tremendous number of, uh, uh, of uh, clinical trials going on right now on existing therapeutics being repurposed 
to uh, other uh, to 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 COVID nineteen uh, purposes. Um, but also, uh, we probably need, uh, and that's if you will, the shortcut that humanity takes in, th in terms of therapies. But we probably need a dedicated therapeutic too, something that. Uh, uh, was uh, is much more efficient, if you will, than the shortcuts that po potentially we will have in the market over the next couple of months. And the third uh, leg of that stool, the proverbial stool, as I mentioned, is uh, a vaccine, which is the long-term solution to to this uh, challenge. And um, uh, and and that is where we are working on. We are working on two other opportunities on those two other legs of the proverbial stool. So we have. We are trying to support, if you will, the solution from all angles, angles and dimensions. Mm -hmm. So um, you've you've tracked a lot of um, <clears throat> hard science, physical science, from laboratory through the process. So I was wondering if 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 the attendees could get a little bit of your experience and gauge in saying when when when, and I'm not speaking just to yours, but just in general. When do you think there might be a new therapeutic that has enough clinical data then behind it that, uh, that can be released out there, a new therapeutic? When do you think that might happen? Months, six months, a year, two years? Yeah, I'm probably more on the optimistic side of things, uh, Luis. I'm, uh, I, I'm hoping that a new therapeutic, which of course has the challenge of proving that it is safe in addition to proving that it's efficacious, um, will probably be uh, with us in the fall, uh, fall okay. uh, towards the end of the year, um, uh, in worst case scenario from my perspective, uh, in terms of brand new therapeutic, existing therapeutics. That was that my follow-up question. Yeah, ex existing. When do you think we might have uh, some data on some of these existing therapeutics that will make it safe to go forward? Well, I, I think we are already getting some of this data, uh, for that matter. There are we are tracking here at Kairos, we are tracking 170 different clinical trials of existing therapeutics, trying to assess efficacy against the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, uh, we are already getting some data and you know, mm -hmm. some of them are, are very much uh, uh, publicized in probably not the, the most scientific manner, one would argue. Um, and that's that causes confusion in the market. But, but having said that though, my estimation is from what we are seeing here is that again, in about maybe three months, one of our existing therapeutics will have proven to be efficacious enough to uh, be proposed, especially uh, for the, the most sick patients, the, the, the most progressed patients in the clinic. Um, the vaccine, though, on the other hand, in case you were to ask me about that, is, is, uh, is uh, 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 in a number of re regards a completely different question and a challenge and because now we are not talking about trying to save somebody who is in dire straits in the hospital we are talking about disseminating millions and millions of doses to uh, people of all ages uh, middle-aged folks all uh, um, folks who are very young infants and thus safety uh, is going to be as you can imagine the primary a stumbling block in addition obviously to being efficacious so being able to prove safety uh, with uh, thousands of uh, patients and volunteers if you will is going to be the critical challenge of uh, of our vaccine so that's going to be um, probably in 2021 and um, mm -hmm. in in my optimistic uh, uh, assessment but i'm hoping for a miracle i would uh, i would welcome a vaccine by by sometime this summer Sure. Yeah. Well, as would we all. Okay. Let's talk about uh, diagnostics then. Um, you know, you you guys are working on um, one diagnostic pro product that you you described. Um, it it seems like there are just hundreds. There are thousands of smart people, maybe more, and there are hundreds of projects moving forward, both on on fast diagnostic testing and also rapid accurate, which is a challenge, antibody testing. So um, when would you expect a lot more of those products to be rolling out? I, I, I hear some are actually, you know, as right now, this weekend, we're going to be rolling out in New Jersey's rolling out some, et cetera. Yeah. So um, we are tracking in our efforts here at Kairos, uh, 74 different products that have already received FDA EUA, the emergency use authorization. So the FDA has already approved 74 
different tests. Um, the, the, the problem with all those is, and you mentioned antibody tests, and obviously we have the RT-PCR tests, which is the gold standard in testing for infection. The problem with all those is that they are uh, currently, the 74 ones that are approved, they are uh, fulfilling only part of the equation. And you need to be able to meet all parts of the equation to have an effective diagnostic. So here's what I mean as an example. There are a lot of very, very accurate tests out there, but it takes a long period of time to get the result back. So there are a lot of RT-PCR at CLIA certified lab diagnostic tests today with very high accuracy, both high sensitivity and specificity. But uh, you need to take um, um, uh, the, the, the sample, you, a, a nasal um, swab or something like that, and then send it to a central lab and get a response back hopefully in one or two days. Well, as you can imagine, high, highly accurate but slow only solves part of the problem. It doesn't solve the problem that I mentioned earlier of uh, the use cases in train stations, in airports, and in restaurants, in movie theaters, right? So that is part of the problem. And, and, and then the other part is the cost of those tests is, is, is pretty high. We need to collectively be able to push that cost down dramatically from wherever it is now to a few dollars um, um, and, uh, and be able to disseminate it uh, to large numbers. I'm hopeful that we will be able to do that. So uh, that's what we are striving here at Kairos to do. We are trying to combine um, high sensitivity and specificity with very rapid uh, 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 time to answer uh, together with uh, field use by non-experts. We cannot have expert technicians in millions of location, in locations. So we need to be able to have the TSA agent, the ticket agent to be able to administer this test in a very reliable fashion. We're trying to bring all those uh, pieces of the puzzle together and a number of other uh, efforts are doing that in parallel to Kairos. Kairos is certainly not the only one. Uh, and my hope is from what I have seen, and we are very close obviously to one specific product, that in a few weeks we will have that out there. And it's gonna make uh, a significant dent uh, on our effort against the coronavirus. As we VCs like to say, it will be a key inflection point in our w war against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. um you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a a question that will probably show my ignorance a little bit, but um, maybe you can uh, enlighten me and maybe some of our attendees. In with diagnostics, if you, regardless of the the method, the fast diagnostics, let's say, why not why not just chain several together? So three different tests um, that are done quickly, and they all three agree. You've got a you you know you're you're in in better shape if if one or two of them agree and then they're different then maybe you you kick it off into something else so why why not why not match these why not pair these up or triple them up it's a perfectly natural question that you're asking but it's uh, it's facing the realities that we have today today we do not have enough test kits to test the people that need to be tested much less <laughs> have enough to test each patient three, four times, right? So that's one reality that we need to be aware of. We don't have enough test kits. So as a result, um, the, just based on that, we wouldn't be able to do that. But you're right, if we were able to do that, and if we were to combine them, we would be able to answer the question, is somebody infected in a much more higher and accurate fashion than one single test would be able to. But that is that would be a... Um, uh, something that we will be doing when we have millions and millions of each one of those tests, and we don't today. So right, right. As, as an example, the, sec the, se the second reality is, as I mentioned to you, is the most accurate tests today, the RT-PCR tests, are typically speaking CLIA lab-based, uh, CLIA certified lab-based, which means that you cannot uh, go and do the test at the pharmacy. You cannot go and do the, the test at the movie theater or at the dentist's office. Instead, you need to take a, a swab and send it in sure. at a central lab. And thus, just that, right, would make it impossible to use in the settings that we need to have the diagnostic in the future. It's not anymore just 
a confirmation for doctors to know, hey, do I need to treat this person or not? It's not a triage tool, but we should be viewing our diagnostics uh, tools in general as the tools that will enable to reopen our economy. And that is one of the largest challenges that we are faced with today. Mm -hmm. um, a question just came through our Q&A box and said, uh, if there are currently no therapeutics that are routinely used for respiratory viral infections now, you know, the regular viral infections don't have a lot of therapeutics available to them. What's, what, what gives you the confidence that there will be a therapeutic that will be efficacious on this virus? Well, A, my optimism, and B, the fact that I can, I, we, we look at the data very, very closely, right? We don't read just, if you will, some uh, publication from CNBC or CBS, whatever have you, and try to decide based on that. We, we, we look at the, the actual scientific papers published on the studies, the ongoing studies, and there is some evidence of, uh, uh, of uh, efficacy there that gives us hope, that gives me hope. And mm -hmm. the reality is, though, is that the, the, the viewer is asking a, a very valid uh, question. We, um, uh, humanity at large, uh, have thus far been very ineffective in treating respiratory, uh, uh, respiratory diseases. So ARDS, uh, um, acute respiratory disease syndrome. Um, is one of those unmet need indications. Sure. Uh, somebody suffering from ARDS, we don't really have good tools. We have shortcuts, as I like to call them, where we have cut corners uh, to try to help them so that they don't go into septic shock, as an example. Uh, but we don't necessarily have something that we are um, that we know will treat the the the, the, um, uh, the pathogenic factor leading to ARDS. So. That is what us as Kairos and other VCs similar to us are doing. We are looking for those hard uh, uh, problems and we are looking for solutions to those hard problems. And it's firmly in our belief that those solutions will come from the great research labs across our nation. We personally speaking, and not personally speaking, we here at Kairos, we, we are investing in a, a, a preclinical drugs with a high unmet need in ARDS. We recognize mm -hmm. that to be oh. a key problem. So as a matter of fact, you could argue that could be a COVID-19 therapeutic. It's not a true therapeutic. Therapy means you solve the actual underlying problem, but the ARDS would be um, you know, the stage that uh, an acute uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected patient would, would go into and having a good tool for ARDS would be a good solution for that patient. But we do need to find specific antiviral uh, technologies, uh, technologies that go against the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. And look, my hope is also created by the fact that now uh, we have technologies that uh, we didn't have in, pre in, in previous pandemics. And I'm not only talking about 1918, but I'm talking about the pandemics in the 50s and the 60s. Look, mm -hmm. we didn't have CRISPR back then. Yeah, we 10 years have. ago. For, yeah. for SARS and MERS, we didn't have that, yeah. As an example, right? I have a very good point, Luis. So, but we do now. And those are mm -hmm. basic core technologies that not only enable us as, as scientists, the scientific teams around the, uh, around the nation to uh, conduct research in a, more, more, in a much more insightful and rapid fashion, but also they could enable therapeutics. So those are the things that make me, if you will, more optimistic than normal. And I would, I, I would actually encourage everybody um, to, to think that way, right? Optimism is a tremendous power. It has a, it's a tremendous force. It makes us all um, focus from the problems into solutions. Rather than me being upset that I'm trying to homeschool my kids and I don't have enough time in the day to do so, to do math, to do English, whatever have you, I, my, my optimism is driving me to say, let's find more COVID-19 solutions. Yes, we have funded three opportunities currently, why, but why not fund 30 as an example? Why not boost our effort in such a way to get out of this, uh, this uh, problem sooner than later? I'm hoping that we will have a V-shaped recovery in the economy. I, the evidence there is not as, as, believe it or not, the evidence there is not as obvious as the evidence that we have in, on the scientific front. On the scientific front, 
on our fight against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, we'll, uh, we will definitely we will definitely go into um, um, into a V-shape, if you will, recovery in that war. On the economy side, we we need to understand the long-term effects of um, of shutting down the economy um, across large uh, swaths of of our economy in general, in general, and thus um, we may be in a little bit of a W there, Luis. We'll see. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. a V. We'll see what happens. Yeah, or 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 a U. I guess we go from uh, V to U to W. I guess in in that sense. Um, so uh, for for those, I, I believe some of our attendees are are university um, uh, attendees, university listeners affiliated with uh, with some research labs and others. So I'm going to get a little bit specific on that and uh, ask your or, uh, opinions about something that's been kicking around here for the three weeks. And that is that uh, some research institutions um, have been talking about a COVID-19 intellectual property pledge, essentially, saying this is too important to lock some of this stuff up with, uh, with uh, intellectual property restrictions. And so uh, what's, there are some pledges out there for non-exclusive royalty-free IP, or in other words, people asking that universities and research institutions and inventors pledge that they're going to uh, uh, put some solutions out there on a non-exclusive royalty-free IP basis. So I wonder if you could give uh, the audience, the attendees, a little bit of background on, on kind of what that means. And then from your perspective, working with research institutions, what, what do you think about that? Look, um, the, the, the pledge is an interesting idea where it says basically, say, look, um, if there is a, a scientific innovation at a university like UCI that can support the effort against SARS-CoV-2, then uh, rather than locking it up in, on exclusive rights for one startup, make it available publicly um, um, with, in a non-royalty bearing fashion. Um, th that implies uh, the following, which I don't believe is correct. It implies that the, the problem that we have today is that uh, in our war against, uh, in our fight against SARS-CoV-2, the problem is that there are solutions that are not being made available uh, in a public enough fashion uh, so, so that uh, that's the reason we are not developing the solutions fast enough. I don't believe that this is true. As a matter of fact, as I told you, we are tracking 74 different diagnostics that have already received FDA EUA. We are tracking 170 different clinical trials and thousands of other opportunities in, in early stages, similar to our vaccine opportunity and our therapeutic opportunity, that um, um, are um, uh, being promoted actively forward. So clearly the problem is not, we don't have enough efforts. The problem more than anything else is that uh, 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 it takes time. As you know, science doesn't happen just like that. It's not magic, right? It's true. We're not talking about alchemy. We are talking about chemistry. Uh, so, and, and it takes time. And if there is anything in our control in that, uh, in that fight, is money, because it takes time and money. And that is why we here at Kairos, we said, hey, look, we're going to pause investing in our quote-unquote regular uh, style investing, and we will put all our efforts for the time being on the fight against SARS-CoV-2, because it takes time and it takes money. So taking away the money part, which is what uh, this pledge could potentially uh, uh, bring, bring to bear, could be a little bit problematic. We here as, uh, as partners to universities, we strongly believe that universities and their researchers need to be compensated appropriately and equitably for the hard work that they are putting over years or over decades, as I mentioned earlier. So that is the license that the university negotiates with uh, um, uh, startups uh, or, or big big pharma companies. That is that is what drives, if you will, this engine forward on an ongoing basis. So taking away from a university that source of income is not going to be a good thing for research in general, especially during these times where over the last few decades, the percentage of GDP that we are spending on research on core research is going down on a very consistent and, and very disconcerting fashion, to be honest. Mm -hmm. 
So it was actually one of the major drivers that drove the founding of Kairos. When we looked at that percentage and we're saying, this is a problem, private sector needs to come in. And this is why we created Kairos and why we are funding exclusively, as I said, scientific innovations and no other good opportunities potentially like dog walking apps and, and uh, burrito delivery apps, because not only they are served well uh, by other VCs, but also um, uh, the, the need is to promote science to be equivalent to anything else that consumers care about today. And in all honesty, that is, uh, that is maybe a little bit of that silver lining, Luis, uh, in terms of uh, this uh, uh, pandemic that we have. I think uh, the fact that scientists are the ones that are going to solve this crisis for us is going to elevate the stature of our scientific community in a significant fashion. And mm. I'm very hopeful um, that uh, we will continue to be listening to our scientists and to be relying our decision making on scientific data, data produced by our scientists, rather than on hearsay and, uh, and, uh, and you know, rumors and so on and so forth. So one of the silver linings from my perspective of this uh, uh, pandemic is that at the end of it, the scientific community is, is going to come out stronger, more attention is going to be paid to it, and hopefully that what we have seen over the years as a percentage of the GDP going down and down in terms of research funding starting to level off and hopefully going up. Yeah. I think that would be a that would be a terrific outcome. Well, uh, listen, thank, and I'm not wrapping up here yet, but I definitely want to thank you for for pointing those things out, pointing out the optimism that you have, and hopefully sharing that optimism with others, and some of the silver linings that will come out of that. Uh, you know, we in in connecting everyone with through these webinars, one of our goals is to uh, share information, but also you know share how how the different parts of the community are working together. And, and I think that is cause for, for optimism on this. So um, I just wanna hit a, a few, uh, just a couple of quick other questions that happen to come through the, through the Q&A and then, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. But um, there was just a very, almost a business of venture capital type of question. And, and I know that as the chief R&D officer, you're, you're focused on the science and, and that part of it. So I'm gonna ask you to put on your fundraising hat and your investor relations hat and saying, um, any, what, any, any sense on what you're hearing on the fund fundraising side? Are LPs hunkering down? Um, do you think uh, there's any chance for any new LP commitments uh, for, for new funds this year, for existing funds that might be going back out into the marketplace? It's a great, a great question that you're asking, Luis, and, and it is very much connected to my earlier comment. Look, it would be, um, a, a fallacy, if I were to tell you, is a, that there is no effect on the on the fundraising side. But clearly, anybody who was thinking on investing into anything is thinking twice, if not three times or four times. <laughs> and that, as a result, that on its own slows down, quote unquote, fundraising, fundraising by startups or fundraising by VCs like ourselves, like funds like ourselves. So that's the negative effect to the VC community at large. The silver lining, though, is again that for scientific funds like ourselves and similar funds like ours, LPs now understand, they say, look, why am I investing in dog walking apps when I can invest in opportunities that can save lives, that can prevent pandemics, not only cure pandemics, but prevent pandemics. So the silver lining now is that that focus on scientific innovation that the pandemic has brought. Um, uh, m makes also LPs, potential investors from funds like ourselves, to say, wow, this, is, this makes 100% sense. I should be investing in something like Kairos because that is where the solutions to key, key challenges of the society will come from. They're not going to come out from some, some just bright ideas from some kids somewhere, but instead they're going to come from the hard work that PIs across the nation are putting in their labs. And, um, uh, and, and as a result, I would say, to answer, uh, get back to the answer to your question, it's a, it's a coin with two faces. One is the, the face that says, hey, look, things are getting a little bit more difficult for fundraising. But for scientific funds, I think it, uh, it produces that clear and abundant reason on why LPs should be investing sure. in scientific funds. 
Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very well said. So, um, Alex, uh, anything else that, uh, that that we haven't covered? I think uh, a lot of the on our pre discussion, I think we've knocked off most of those bullet points. Anything else come to mind that you'd like to share? Look, no, nothing new other than trying to reiterate that uh, I, our belief is that our um, scientific community here in the United States, but globally as well, uh, mm -hmm. brings tremendous innovation to the table that is typically speaking going really untapped by the VC community. We Kairos and our and our uh, and the funds that are similar to us, we are really a tiny percentage of the VC monies that exist out there. So our belief is that these scientists do phenomenal work that needs to be funded by VCs like ourselves. And our belief is that it is exactly this work that's going to get us out of this trouble that we are in today with SARS-CoV-2. But I would be happy to answer any questions from the audience, should there be any, Luis. Yeah, I, I think for now we've we've got them all uh, we've got them all covered. So I think yeah. uh, we'll we'll take advantage of that. And uh, here, while uh, that reminds me, let me uh, bring up uh, this again. And. Uh, for everyone. And so uh, on the, your screen, I believe you should be seeing uh, the website for kairosventures.com. And Alex was kind enough to share his email address on there as well. So if you uh, would like to reach out directly, you're, you're welcome uh, to do so. And we appreciate that very much. So okay. Alex, um, thank you so much for your time and your optimism and what you're doing. And you know, God willing, we will get uh, through this in, on a quick basis on the optimistic side that you have. And and that, uh, and, and that your projects that you are funding uh, actually do make it out to market. So if they make it out to market, they start affecting um, uh, patients and uh, folks that are getting tested. I think that in and of itself will be a, a wonderful outcome for that. So um, thank you, no, Luis. Oh, my very pleasure. Much, I very much appreciate the partnership with UCI in general and the opportunity to talk to your uh, to, to, to your community, your ecosystem today. Happy to take uh, questions offline through my email from any of your folks, especially the scientists that may, may have some ideas that we, we would be able to fund on the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, terrific. So thank you again. And uh, a reminder that a recording of this webinar will be available. Uh, we will get that up as soon as possible. It might be this afternoon or it'll be on Monday morning. And you can find that at our website at Beal Applied Innovation, which is innovation.uci.edu. And if you click on the events tab, you'll see an archive of the weekly webinars. So Alex will be up there uh, this afternoon or Monday and you can uh, view our other three webinars that we have already. So um, uh, make sure that uh, you join us next week when we'll be speaking with Kerry Ransom from OC4 Venture Studios, and he's gonna describe his new venture studio and the Orange County tech ecosystem overall. And I have my idea for like three or four weeks from now, we're gonna have Alex on one side of the screen and we're gonna have a dog walking burrito delivery app entrepreneur on the other side and they can just bad mouth each other for 35 minutes. That should be very exciting. No bad mouthing whatsoever. They deserve a lot of money, but so do scientists. Maybe a little bit more than the dog walking apps. Maybe that's the difference between us. But anyway, no, well, look, from my, from my side, Luis, stay safe, stay healthy and stay positive. Yes, I agree. And, and likewise uh, to you, Alex, to the Kairos team and to all of our attendees on there. We're gonna go ahead and shut down our video. We'll, um, we'll leave this screen up a little bit longer in case anybody wants to uh, copy down those, uh, those email addresses, but otherwise we'll sign off. Everyone have a safe and healthy weekend. Thank you, bye-bye now. All right, bye.